our next segment, we will also do our podcast episode, which is Best Bets for Tuesday, March 12th in the association. We'll get you best bets. We've got size. We've got totals. We've got a really good slate for tomorrow. Should be some good stuff. I'm looking at a great night tonight. Uh, we'll catch everything up. We'll also go over our bets for the evening and all that and more on today's show. I want to let you know that Buckets is presented by BetMGM. Use bonus code ACTION when signing up to get $150 in bonus bets when you bet $5. For new users in Arizona, Colorado, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wyoming. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21+. plus. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Okay, let's get into this right now off the top, boys. So the Cleveland Cavaliers did not get Donovan Mitchell back tonight. There was some talk that he could play in this game, but he did not. Darius Garland had a great game with 30 points. Uh, Jared Allen had a good game with 15 points and 10 boards, but it wasn't enough as the Phoenix Suns get the win behind 24 from Bradley Beal, 27 from Devin Booker, and 37 from the Slim Reaper. 14 to 26 from the field. He struggled for a little bit and then got hot for Kevin Durant. Eight boards, six assists, one steal. He had some phenomenal defense on the weak side in this game. Him and Yusuf user, user Nurkic continued their good play together. They get the win here. Good bounce back spot after the loss to the Celtics. But, you know, this was a back and forth affair. And for a while there, it was really kind of shaky. But the Suns were able to rattle off enough to get the difference versus the Cavs without Evan Mobley and Donovan Mitchell. Um, I want to start kind of right here, Jay. Are you still, weeks ago, I had kind of asked you about it, and you've kind of like, you've been looking a little bit higher on them. Are you still high on the Phoenix Suns' chances of coming out of the Western Conference? Yeah, I mean, I'm still high on this team. I don't know about making it to the finals, but I definitely think they can get out of the first round. Um, that's yeah. more than a lot of people think that they can do as well. So uh, as long as you have Devin Booker, uh, Kevin Kevin Durant, and Bradley Beal on the floor together, and they can get some production from guys like Grayson Allen, Royce O'Neal, and Nurkic as well, uh, I still think this team has a very high ceiling. And I also think that they're kind of just BSing through the regular season because they know it doesn't matter what – like you could go 73-9 and nine in the regular season. That doesn't matter when it gets to the playoffs. So um, obviously everything slows down into the half court and the playoffs. You can't double team these guys uh, and one on one. They're, ap they're all three of them are absolute bucket there. So, um, yeah, I'm still pretty high on the Suns. Probably probably be the uh, highest person um, that, that covers the NBA on the Phoenix Suns. But, yeah, I don't I don't really get off of my takes. Still pretty high on the Suns. And um, I'd love to see a Suns Nuggets first round matchup. Oh, boy, that'd be good. I don't think we're going to get, though. I think we're probably going to wind up with uh, I think the Suns wind up in the six. I still think they're going to probably get that six seed. Um, Michael, you know, I think if we look at kind of the, the makeup of the team, my struggle with Phoenix has been this. Um, what's their identity? Like, I mean, I've been asking that question. Like, I saw him beat Denver last week, which is a really great win. And I still came out of that, that game with this question is like, what's their identity? Like, who are they? And the answer is just kind of like, good shot makers go burr. Like, that's, that's them. Is like mid-range shot makers. They shoot a ton of mid-range shots. They don't shoot a lot of threes. There's like so many ways that you can get a tactical advantage on them. And they're basically just like, okay, yeah, but we have Devin Booker and Kevin Durant, and Bradley Beal and Grayson Allen is going to hit a lot of threes and use of Nurkic has been fantastic. I worry about the bench. There's like a lot of reasons to worry about this team, but I think one of the reasons why I've had a really difficult time kind of getting my, getting a feel for them is that, you know, they're 18 to one to win the title, which is great value considering how high they were in preseason eight to one to win the Western conference at bet MGM King of sports books. Uh, I have a hard, hard time kind of figuring out like what, what's their plan. Like what's the, we're going to win with this. Like this is what we're bringing to the table other than Kevin Durant and Devin Booker are going to make a bunch of, of tough shots. And I don't know how sustainable that is game over game over a seven game series. Yeah, my biggest concern for them, Matt, is the point of attack defense. I feel like yeah. who are they throwing at Garland when he's out there? And when Jared Allen comes to set a high screen and goes a step or two beyond the three-point line and allows Garland to get up some speed, are you putting Bradley Beal there? Are you putting Devin Booker, who carries a large offensive load as the main point of attack defender? Is it Grayson Allen, who's a good underrated defender, but he shouldn't be your lead point of attack defender? And then on the back end of that, once that team that first person does get beat, then you have Yusuf Nurkic as your main rim protector. That's another, you know, cause for pause. They lack rebounding around him. 
the identity of the Suns is the perfect way to put it, kind of a lack of identity. I was actually watching the game tonight, and I think they had a nice schedule advantage having Cleveland off the second leg of a back-to-back without Max Struess, without Dean Wade. So it's not even just uh, Mobley and Mitchell. They were missing some key role players too, so the Cavaliers were just depleted. And I was watching Phoenix and thinking, this team has no identity, and maybe Frank Vogel isn't totally the right coach for this team. I'm not calling for his job per se, because he's a great defensive coach. They don't really have a defensive system, but should they just be, if they're going to lean all in, should they just be leaning all into seven seconds or less and like bringing back the Dan Tony style? They do not generate enough three pointers. They need someone who's going to force them to shoot three pointers. They don't get to the rim enough. And they're, if you're going to allow someone to attack you at on the perimeter without having the right help defense, and then your counterpoint, is trying to feast off the mid-range, that is not going to work over a seven-game series against some of these top-tier teams. So while I agree with Jay, they might win a first-round series because it's looking like if they end up in that play-in spot, and I think it's worth pointing out, Suns' remaining strength of schedule, number one hardest in the league for playoff teams. There's Utah and Charlotte above them. Those are not playoff teams. The only reason why Charlotte's above them, Matt, is because Phoenix plays Charlotte and they play each other. (laughs) So if the records were reversed, Phoenix would have a harder strength of schedule. So we look at it like their average opponent is going to be an Eastern Conference Orlando Magic or or a Western Conference Dallas Mavericks. It is going to be really tough for them to pull themselves out of that play and They might get a good first-round matchup, considering the top of the West might be the teams you want to face in the first round at this point. That's a whole nother discussion. But this team is not winning. Don't take the 18-1. to one. You'd have to plan to hedge it. If you're planning to hedge a futures, skip it altogether. Yeah, I, th- I think where I'm kind of at is um, I think – they're probably the team that I want that if you're an OKC backer, you want them to face. I think they can outgun. I, I think the, the Thunder can outgun the Suns. They don't have the size. Like Nurkic will have a huge series. No question. It's a big body, but the Thunder are are a better shooting team. They are more athletic. They will out, just space them out with threes. Even if the Thunder don't hit threes, they're still going to just outpace them with numbers. The Wolves, I think, are an interesting one. If they wind up in a 2 7 versus the Minnesota Timberwolves, that to me is like an interesting one where without towns, right? Where, okay, Minnesota's offensive floor is so low. Like they have such a hard time scoring that maybe that's where like they get in trouble there. Uh, Jay, I did know, I saw that in the Action Network app, you did have the the Suns tonight um, played that and then you came back live a little bit on the Cavs. What did you kind of see going into that game that uh, got you on the Suns tonight? Well, it was a fifth game in seven nights for the Cavs. I just didn't, I hated the fact that the Suns came out and were letting them get literally whatever they want. That's always what you worry about the Suns. Now, they they can flip, flip the switch, but you can't be getting down 15, 16 points to the Cavs, letting Darius Garland do whatever you want. Like, you got to have, like me as a basketball player, you have to have the switch flipped on from the beginning of the game. You can't come out there messing around because the team will mess around and beat you. But obviously, when they really did flip the switch um, and, and still almost lost, but when they finally flipped the switch, they went on ahead and uh smacked them up but yeah it wasn't just a back-to-back or third game in four nights it was the whole it was that old fifth uh five games in seven nights which is always a fade spot in the nba so um yeah i'd still i'd still uh like the suns in that game it was a really great game obviously kd i mean if kd is gonna play like that just, just watch out man That's, and booker is obviously still hungry he's never won a championship as well they've gotten to the finals uh with the suns but he's never got over that hump bradley bill has never even sniffed a finals as well so these guys are hungry and let's just see uh, i always say nothing matters in the uh in the regular season all matters about uh in the playoffs yeah uh i want i do want to say this like i think kevin durant has been incredible this season like he has been so good every single night the scoring from every single spot on the floor is just spectacular. Uh, he's been absolutely insane. And like, honestly, it's a bummer. They haven't been healthy because even with that much talent, I I feel like KD would be in line for at least a little bit of MVP discussion. If they, they've been healthy because they do have a really good record when, when Beal, KD, like, that's kind of counter to all this is like Suns fans feel like it's, it's, it's injuries. And most teams that aren't good, like even Hornets fans are like, well, you know, LaMelo was hurt all season. So it's like, <laughs> you're not good. It's just like, oh, you were hurt. Um, but at the same time, like, look, they have missed their entire team was predicated upon three dudes. And if all three dudes aren't ready, that's like a fundamental undercut of who they are. But if they had been if they had had a little more health luck, KD was good enough to be in the MVP discussion. That's how good he's been. 
Um, I've made this argument and like, it's, this is a tough one to kind of like describe. Um, I don't think that he is the most, he's not the great, he, like he says he belongs in the greatest of all time conversation, top five. I can't get there because he doesn't have the accomplishments and a series of decisions that he made. But I will say if, if when they ask me later, when my grandkids, if I have them are like, Hey, who's like the best player you've ever seen? Kevin Durant's on my short list. Like he's one of the best players I've ever seen. That dude is so phenomenal in every single area of the game. He is just incredible. Um, Michael, what'd you have tonight? What were you on tonight in the association? I want to talk about those bets real quick. I had a great night in Suns Cavs. I'm actually wondering if me and Jay Money had the same kind of concept right now. I played Suns minus four. It's a big thing of what I do is try and gain closing line value and then play back the other side of the closing number. So I played Suns minus four before the Donovan Mitchell news broke and grabbed that. And then I played back Cavaliers plus seven. So I middled that and that was beautiful. I also played the under in the Warriors Spurs game. Uh, they were getting Wemby back. It was the second game that those teams have faced in a row. We see when teams play each other in these back-to-back -back sets in the NBA, they learn each other's tendencies a little bit. They know how to, the defender knows how to position themselves to move the offender from away from their spot. So you generally see more isolation sets, more matchup-based approaches, and less scoring. So it's really nice to attack unders in those spots. Uh, I was on both of those, and I had a sweep of a night. 62% of people in the chat saying the Suns will not win the Western Conference this season. So not not a lot of confidence with them. Jay's out in the on, Jay's out on the island, but I'm not I'm just kidding. He always said they would get out of the first round. Uh <laughs> I think it's uh I think I look, I think they're a fascinating team. It's gonna be interesting to see where they shake out in the breakdown. Uh I want to talk a little bit more about some of the officiating changes. So we've been talking about this a lot on buckets lately about this change that we've seen. Um, Ethan Sherwood Strauss had an article yesterday. There was one on the um, from Tam ha Tom Haberstrow at the Finder, which was the first one to kind of tip me off that we'd seen this crash in officiating and in free throw rate. I've been giving this out that the top five teams in free throw rate, uh, it is ridiculous where this is at right now. So teams that are top five for the season in free throw rate. So the, the percentage of, of possessions that end in free throws for them. Those teams since the all-star break are 36 and 12 to the under. That is 75%. That is phenomenal with where we're getting to here with a sample of 48 games. It's not, it's only a couple of weeks, but that's still like 48 games now. Like we've still been hitting and it's still popping uh, consistently on the unders. Like we're still seeing these games hit under um, pretty consistently. And there's been other spots that I found where um, the Hornets are another one where I gave this out on last night's show as uh, from for best bets on buckets as well as on Green Dot Daily, which you can catch in the Action Network app. It's the Hornets team total under. That one's been absolutely dynamite since they made their trades and since this crash. So there is now starting to be like a conversation about like there actually was discussion in the league about changing not the rules. Like this is what's frustrating is everyone keeps saying like it's a rule change. It's not a rule change. Okay. They, they haven't legislated any sort of rule change. It's just what the officials are calling in certain terms of discretionary calls. And a lot of it is just teams are not getting into the bonus because they're letting them play more. Jay, you have been on this and you have been frustrated with the offense, the, the season with how out of control it's been. Are you loving what we've seen with more defense and making it tougher on the offensive players lately? I love it. I'm just a fan of actual basketball. I just don't want to see these guys throwing themselves into the defenders and then calling the foul on the, on the defensive guy, especially not when they have their hands straight up. So I just feel like it's like it's starting to get back to some even basketball where things aren't all offensive. Um, obviously, I mean, I don't necessarily see about seeing uh, games like Sixers and Knicks uh, last game, 79-73. That's maybe going a little too far there, but um, like offense is good, but I just feel like this is still the game of basketball. You still have to play, have to be able to play offense and defense if it's going to be all offense and every game is going to be a three-point shootout uh me as a kind of like an old basketball fan I'm, I'm just not a fan of that so I just I like the fact that they're letting them play a little bit more now obviously you got the players 
um, harping the refs every single time. Hey, where's that foul? And I'm, I'm, I like that they're not giving them the touch fouls or the throw your body into the defender, giving those fouls. So I'm just a fan of actually playing basketball. A lot of these guys are really great at basketball. You don't need to, you don't need uh, help from the refs or to shoot 15 to 20 free throws. I'm sure Joel and B would hate uh, hate this as well. Jimmy Butler is another guy that that uh, most more than half his points comes from the free throw line, man. So I'm just a fan of actual basketball. These guys are great offensive players. You don't need to get to the line or uh, like Paul George says, some of these players, they're not even thinking about scoring. They just literally go into the lane and like, oh, let me go and get to the foul line. Uh, it's not that's not real basketball. So a couple of interesting trends on this, Michael, that I found that I think are just absolutely fascinating. Um, if there's one team that you want to be buying right now, basically, if you're like, I want to try and find angles to play off of this officiating change. The number one team I have for you is the Miami Heat. So since let's go back. This season, when the Heat give up five, when the difference between the opponent's free throws and theirs, if they face a free throw gap of five or more, so the opponent makes at least five more free throws than them or more, attempts rather, not makes, just attempts, the Heat are one and 11 straight up this season when that happens. One and 11, okay? That is worse than the league by a mile. Now, since the change this started i was talking to some analytics folks and they're like we started to see a little bit of the shift in the first week of february like that was where we st really started it wasn't even all-star like the first two weeks it was like huh that's weird free throw rates are down that's when it started to change so i looked at since february 1st miami in that time is 10 and 6 straight up and 11 and 5 against the spread at 68.8 percent that is best in the nba this makes a lot of sense right if you take away the ability for teams to be able to draw fouls on them and actually make teams score on their defense, and if you make it to where teams can't get separation on them in the bonus, and it's more of a rock, rock fight and they're able to drag them down, this really favors Miami. I want to talk a little bit more about some angles of how to approach this change, Michael, but I do think that if I've got one team that I want to take a look at, it's really the Miami Heat because they're setting up like once again, spring is here and things are falling in the line for the Miami Heat. Matt, I think that's a really smart take to say, how are we seeing these trends and totals and then flip it around and play it in a spread, right? Find the correlated angle for a spread. That's very intelligent. I also just want to add on to your point. You said 36 and 12 earlier. That's based off the closing line. And we are seeing these totals drop five or six points from open. So if we're even doing this show at 11 o'clock Eastern on a Monday night, these things still have room to go. And some of these numbers are going to move. So we could even get ahead. And I wonder how many floated in that middle CLV zone. Because if you look at Suns, Cavs, that game dropped five points tonight. Open was 226, closed was 221. Warriors, Spurs, the other game that I bet open was 230 and a half, closed was 225. So these numbers are also moving in reflection. So I think that this is really smart to layer on playing a spread, talk about where these lines are opening and closing. But the only thing that I want to point out in saying, how long does this trend go? Do we think it makes it through the season? Do we think it's establishing playoff play now? Is it almost a precursor to FIBA? Because that's the type of basketball we're going to see there a little bit. Right. My one hesitation, Matt, and I'd love your and Jay's opinion on this, is we've seen in the past coming out of the summer break, them try and do this reinterpretation of rules and call less fouls. And you see the first few weeks of the NBA season have less free throws. Now, I'm wondering if coming out of the All-Star break, are we just doing this reinterpretation of rules and it's going to be another short-lived spurt like we saw last year? If you went back to the early season data, their free throws were way down at the beginning of last season. Yep. And then when we got to the end of the season, there were more free throws in that one season than ever before. So it's like, explain that. We were trying to take out the flopping. We were calling flopping on the offense. We were calling technical fouls doing it. And by the end of the season, more free throws than ever. So it's just about like, when is this moment going to happen? Is it a trend here to stay? Or is it something that might fade as we start to get down to like the silly season of the NBA? A lot of this really honestly is the battle is with the, with the star players is that they complain so much. No one cares about what Rudy Gobert says. No offense, Rudy, but like, <laughs> No, no, duly noted. Uh, I didn't have him in my star players when you first made that qualifier. Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, but like, 
and you know, to be honest, like Trey Young's out with injury, and that's part of this. Yep. But you're you're gonna see guys getting frustrated, and you're gonna see them going to the officials and talking a lot about not getting calls. And you're gonna see it from these teams that are top five in free throw right now. Some of these are in the teams that aren't gonna draw any sort of attention, like the Magic. The Magic are not gonna get there, but you're gonna see it more from teams like Milwaukee, who they're actually a really fascinating one. So I looked at today, I'm working on an article that kind of looks at okay. Let's look at before and after February 1st. Like, what what did this look like? What's the difference between their free throw rates on offense and defense? Here's what's really fascinating about Milwaukee. They were, their offensive efficiency has gone way down because they're not drawing as many free throws, but their defensive efficiency has improved even more because they're no longer getting teams into the bonus. And like, it's not all that. Some of this is just like random variance in shooting, but it's been very interesting to see that, that basically the Bucks are transitioning into a tougher type of team, even though some of the results aren't great. And like, they have really bad nights like that game versus the Clippers defense was a joke. Like I still have real worries about their defense versus high level opponents, but the overall trends are really fascinating in that Milwaukee's basically like, yeah, no, they like they lost a big advantage offensively, but they got way better defensively. And that's obviously um, linked to, to getting doc rivers on board as well. You know, you talked about um, how long it's going to last. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we're back to the guys complaining and flopping and they just wear them down. And so in two weeks, it starts to tick back up. But I do think it's going to be kind of interesting to watch. Um, Jay, you got thoughts on this about how long the referees can kind of hold up against the barrage of complaints from the players? Yeah, have you ever got, have you guys ever seen Luca complaining to the refs? Like even once. Um, but uh regards to that, no, I did see Anthony Edwards like complaining to the refs a ton the other day. He was just like, Where are the foul calls? And some of these are actually foul calls, but I just feel like after the whole season, after you getting those touch fouls, I'm glad that the refs are getting ready for NBA uh, for getting for uh getting ready for playoff basketball. So what I'm hoping, uh, now what I hope and what's actually gonna happen are two different things, but I'm hoping that they're just getting ready for playoff basketball. And obviously the last few weeks of the season or maybe even last month can be like a little bit different basketball the playoff teams are kind of getting ready for uh, the playoffs maybe taking their foot off the gas but hopefully this is like the way that they're calling the games is uh to, is to stay because they're going to get the the players are going to argue them regardless i don't think that that's going to change so it's all about the refs staying consistent and hopefully if they stay consistent enough then these guys will uh get out of their ears or, or take or give them a t man but i just had to mention luca because i feel like at least 10 times a game he has his arms up or not getting back on defense uh looking towards the refs okay so there's like an uh, you mentioned luca and before we start the next segment i do and we'll start the best bets here in a sec i did want to hit on that real quick because the mavericks are another team that i kind of identified uh so the dallas mavericks when the opponent attempts five or more free throws than them when they're in a, that kind of a hole um this season they have gone they have been they are three and ten straight up they are three and 10 when the opponent shoots five or more free throws. And if you're wondering the best in that, like <laughs> the Celtics are six and two when they're in a dull, like the Kings are 14 and six. It is not like an automatically, like this is not one of those trends where if, if opponents shoot five or more free throws, everybody loses. Like there's a lot of teams that are like, okay, between 40 and and 75%. The Mavericks are not one of them. They were three and 10 since this change since February 1st, the Dallas Mavericks are 10 and six against the spread and straight up. Okay. So what, like, what do we kind of make of that? Right. The under is seven and nine is nine and seven. The under is nine and seven. So it's just, it's not as good as some of the other ones. It's a little bit better. The reason here's like how I've kind of capped this, how I'm looking at it based off of watching some Mavericks games. The key here is that the Mavs can't defend point of attack. That's what Michael was talking about. Like they really struggle at it. They don't have, have point of attack defenders. So the teams that can defend point of attack, they really benefit from this as being good defenses that are going to get better, but they already had that advantage. The Mavericks, it's taking a weakness of theirs and it's limiting it. And even though Luca is a foul baiting, grifting machine, he's also efficient as hell. Like their offense is also killer. And so what you see here is these teams that can survive, that do not need to grift, they are the teams that I think are really thriving in this environment because it's like, yeah, no, okay, you're not going to call the fouls. I wish you would call the fouls, but we're going to score anyway. And that's what I think we're going to see. And like, that's what you should see. That's what we want to see, right? Is like, you should be able to score without having to flail your body and just bump into guys and draw fouls to get in the bonus. 
And that's what I think we're going to continue to see. So interesting conversation. We'll keep it up uh, today. We'll talk to more about this because these trends continue to be red hot for the unders. It's not like an auto play on every single game, but there are a lot of good ones, including I have one that we're going to talk about when we do best bets, which we'll do right now as we start part two, the podcast edition of Buckets. Welcome to Buckets, brought to you by BetMGM, the king of sportsbooks. My name's Matt Moore. I'm the senior NBA writer for the Action Network, and this is your Best Bets episode for Tuesday, March 12th in the Association. I've got with me tonight Michael Fiddle. He's going to join me as well as Jay Money. Jay Money is money on Twitter, on YouTube, and in the Action Network app. Make sure to check out his YouTube page. Check out all that great stuff and check out the Action Network app and our YouTube page if you have not yet. If you're listening to this, go to youtube.com slash the Action Network. We now have Buckets Live on Mondays and Thursday nights where we recap the biggest stories of the night, talk about the betting impacts. We went over our bets tonight and we talked about this continuing trend of unders. Lots of great content. Check out the YouTube version if you want to hear more. I want to let you know that today's show is brought to you by BetMGM, the king of sportsbooks. Use bonus code ACTION when signing up to get $150 in bonus. Bonus bets when you bet $5 for new users in Arizona, Colorado, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wyoming. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Well, I'll give you a quick heads up. The great state of North Carolina, go Tar Heels, I have a future on them, is launching sports betting. They have launched today. We have offer promos for you up on the Action Network for you to get into the game, North Carolina. We will catch you up on everything you need to know on how to bet in the great state of North Carolina. If you're in the Tar Heel State, take advantage of the best sign-up offers across every sports book. A link to all those offers is in the episode description. Just go in there. I promise you're going to be like, wait, that book's running? You're going to be surprised, and you're going to find a great promo you want to be at these books. When we talk about shopping for the best lines, about making sure that you're getting the best of the number, you got to be able to do that by having access to those books. So you want to check it out. If you're in North Carolina, check out that link in the episode description. All right, let's get started with best bets for the Tuesday slate. Michael, welcome to the show for the first time. Given best bets, give me something hot. Tell me what your best bets are for Tuesday, and then we'll do the cap. Yeah, I like how my dog made an appearance onto the podcast before me, but... Oh, I like the Knicks minus 4.5. I understand me and Jay Money both have this as well. But I often talk about key numbers in my handicapping. Five is the second most common oh, outcome knew. in the NBA. Michael's huh? new. Michael's new. And I didn't give him the rundown. All you got to do is say your picks, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you that. I'm going to have you do the cap. You run down all I've your I've listened best- to 500 episodes, so I shouldn't be that new. It's going to be Knicks minus five. It's going to be the Pacers Thunder over 236 and the Clippers minus 6.5. I love that Michael's coming on the show. And the first thing he's doing is he's going head to head against me on two bets tonight. Just phenomenal stuff. You're not on buckets until you've gone head to head with me and destroyed me head to head. That's the, that's like the welcome show. Jay money is money. He is not new. Jay, what's your best bet for Tuesday? I bet the Knicks minus four and a half. All right. Uh, I've got uh, two bets here. OKC under. 230. I've actually got three tonight. OKC, Indiana under 238 and a half going up against Michael. The Minnesota Timberwolves plus six and a half going up against Michael. I'm also going to take the Knicks under 211 and a half. Since both of you have Knicks, let's start on that one. Jay, give me the cap for why you like the New York Knicks minus four and a half, minus five, some sixes. Let me know the number. If there's not a number you like it at, you usually don't care, but I'll go ahead and say, give me the numbers that you like it at. Why do you like the Knicks tomorrow night? Yeah, I'd like it up to seven. There was the spread in the last game where they lost outright 79 to 73. Some old school Eastern Conference uh, basketball like there was, like the like some 1990s basketball there was. But Tyrese Maxey is in this one after being out four games for a uh, concussion. That's why the line has went down. But I also expect uh, OG Ananobi to be back in this game. He's been doing some five on five. He's been doing some contact. Um, he did get upgraded to questionable here, and the Knicks need him in this spot. This is a big game. They're obviously battling with the Sixers for playoff spots as well. So uh, after just 
just taking a loss to them. This is a big game to come back here and react. Um, this is their uh, third, fourth straight home game as well for the Knicks. Now, you know me. I love taking these spots where two teams play in the same arena. I like to bet on the loser of the first uh, game, especially when they're the favorite as well, especially when I believe that they're the better overall team. Um, I, th I like the Knicks here to bounce back. I expect Jalen Brunson to have a lot better game as well. And it's just OG Adenobi, like their defense is just like flips a switch whenever he's out there. Remember when he first got uh, traded over there, they had like the number one defense in the league for like the first 10 games uh, that he played. I think that's how important he is as a defender. You put him on your best player on the other team and he's going to absolutely shut him down here. So uh, one of my COVID bounce back J spots, revenge game J spots, rocking with the Knicks here uh, with revenge at home. All right, I got to see this. Uh, all right, since 2019, uh, in this duplex spot where they're playing twice in a week, and the team was favored, and they lost, and now they're home. Um, if they are, no, they're favorites in this one. They lost the previous one, and they're home now. 120 and 61 straight up, 66%. That's pretty good. 94, 85, and 2 at 53% ATS. I'm gonna look up and what it was that they lost the previous one. This is like the key is actually if they were if they were favorites in the previous one. That's like the the key met metric here because it basically means that as long as the the number doesn't move on it, uh, it's pretty significant. And yeah, that goes up uh, quite a bit there. Uh, bumps it up to roughly 54 percent is what that uh, comes in on, which is a key for getting us over the threshold of how to do that. I like that spot. Uh, Michael, give me your cap on why you're also on the New York Knicks. Yeah, I agree with everything Jay said. Love that OG Ananobi has a chance to come back. Love that we're back in the garden. But I do think the number matters. The number very much often matters to my handicapping process. Talked about this briefly earlier. Key numbers are pretty much baked into everything that I do. Five is the second most common outcome in the NBA. It's also the most common push number in the NBA, uh, just by volume, because so many games are priced around this number. With it moving from minus four and a half to now onto the five or five and a half, even at some sharper books. So we are clearly seeing this move in that direction. So I like grabbing the minus five. But if you're looking at a 5.5 or a six, because we've gone through such a key number, I like just taking the money line at that point. If you've lost value through a very important outcome and common outcome in NBA basketball, then play the money line and play it for less exposure. I don't think you need to hit a minus 225 line for 2.25 units to win one, you could just lay your normal, whatever you were going to, going to lay on the spread and just take the insurance points because it's worth it if it's moved past these common outcomes. I have really a hard time getting a power rating on this game in part because there's games where I, there's like a lot of the data for the Sixers is kind of like not that bad without MB. Like they're not good. They've lost their asses off, but like they're not getting killed every single night but they're also not good, right? So it's like, how much do you downgrade them from their full season number? The Knicks are even messier where it's like, okay, so like I got to figure out like, all right, Julius Randle plus OG Anobi is like a cluster injury. Like I, it's just too complicated trying to figure out the Knicks. I do think I'm gonna probably give them a, a point upgrade on OG um, for his, for coming back on the spread. That sounds light given that OG had like one of the best net rating impacts in the league before his injury. But I also don't want to overreact, especially with the number of games remaining and with the rest of the injuries, the Knicks are just banged up right now. They're just really banged up. So I'm going to give them a point upgrade here. I still can't get to this number being where it's at, even with a massive downgrade. Like I've got the Sixers downgraded by five points off Embiid, and I still can't get to this number, even with all their slide. Like that's that's after all their losses. I still can't get to that number. Um, but I will say I, I did get this wrong when I was doing the numbers on the duplex spot. I looked at this. Um, when they were a favorite in the previous game and they lost and now they're home, those teams are 29 and nine straight up at 76% and 24 and 14 at 63% against the spread. So I've got like the number side of it and Jay's sitting there nodding at me like, yeah, it's a revenge spot. Like, what are we doing? It like, makes sense. Yes. It's like, my spot, man. You know, you know, it just, it, like, it just makes you know, perfect sense. We don't need all these these numbers. It's a revenge spot, so uh, I appreciate that. All right, let's get a little head to head here, Michael. Let's uh, let's start here with Thunder Pacers. Um, tell me why you like the over on a game uh, that is at two thirty eight and a half. It's a pretty pretty high number compared to where the totals are at these days, but it's the Pacers, so I get it. Uh, give me your cap for why you like the over in OKC Indiana. It was 
a simple top-down handicap, which is just understanding where all the market numbers sit, understanding where the opening number was, what direction the market's moving, and grabbing anything that is an outlier. So I saw this game opened at 235.5. There was a 236 remaining, and the entire board was moving to 237.5 or 238.5. So simply just knowing that there was a discrepancy here and saying this number at 236 is eventually going to catch up because at 235.5, they all moved to the 238. So I picked it off as a top-down handicapping discrepancy. Uh, I agree with everything that you've said about unders. I've actually not really liked the Indiana Pacers talk about lost identity with the Suns. I actually think the loss of Bruce Brown kind of bringing in and trying to force the Pascal Siakam stuff, they don't have the same identity that they did early in the season when they were just blitzing teams and scoring 150 on any given night. Uh, So I will be playing this back at some point. I just know that there was clear closing line value to be gained. I would still wait on it if you're seeing, if you're seeing a 238 and a half, you could take the under if you're on Matt's side. But if you're seeing a 237 and a half, considering there's so many 238 and 238.5 showing up, just wait and see how far this goes. See if it gets to 239, see if it gets to 240 and then take the under. I will be joining Matt on the under eventually, but I'm going to ride this steam while I can. I just wanted to say one thing, if I can. Shoot, Bruce Bruce Brown was horrible for the Pacers. Well, I just want to say it. that's that's why that's why they traded him. He was absolutely horrible for that team. I agree. It's more of a play style thing in the way yeah, that he I was just able to be a. It just there were so many wings out there, and they just moved so fast. And Siakam is someone who likes ball in his hands to initiate, and someone who likes to get onto the the elbow to the nail and then create a little bit. It, it just creates a little disruption with what the Pacers are doing. I even think it's not crazy to ask if Siakam's going to stay, but that might be the conversation for another time. See, I will disagree with you there because I think one of the things that you got to kind of frame this as is like, you're right that they don't have the same identity they had early in the season because they're trying to find a new one. Yep. And we've seen pieces of it. Like they had a tough loss to the Wolves the other night because Ant did Ant things. They played great in that game, including like a phenomenal possession late in the game where they spaced out Gobert to the corner and Halley and Siakam ran pick and roll and Halliburton him with a, with a pocket pass. And there was nobody for Minnesota to defend the rim. Like that stuff is going to execute a lot better in the playoffs. Let's get back to the cap because here's something to kind of keep in mind. You're right in terms of like the, the team quality, but when we're doing the, the total play here, I think one of the things that's really important to kind of key in on is how have they evolved? Teams evolve over the course of a season. And a lot of the Pacers numbers are built off of their early season performance. Now, the problem is like when the Pacers get rolled, they get the absolute shit kicked out of their defense. Like they fall apart and they look miserable. And there are nights when that happens. However, since January 1st, which includes a large stretch of games where that's like where they started to really turn the corner is after the end season tournament, they had a stretch where they were losing much like the Lakers. And Carlisle was like, we're not going to go anywhere unless we stop a little bit. I get the offense is great. We got to stop guys a little bit. And they responded and they kind of ticked down from being the worst defense of all time to being like, not great. And that's what you really need to see. So I looked this up over at Clean the Glass. And this is since January 1st versus top 10 defenses. Indiana was on the whole season second in offensive rating, which makes sense. They were lighting up teams early in the season. They slid to ninth, but their defense also improved to 20th, which is enough for us to be in range here for, oh, okay. So like they might provide a little bit of resistance for OKC and their offense isn't quite as good. Um, I have this projected under, this is a projection play for me. I have this now. I have OKC consistently projected under at home in large part because of, all of their um all of their kind of issues um i have this projected un- like okc is really great but i've missed on them except recently last three pay- uh, thunder home games have gone under so i've i'm kind of tracking here with a trend catching up to my model so i'm going to go ahead and i'm, pl- I'm going to play the under i think that his play of catching the number at 236 is good i will probably by the way i haven't tracked this in the app i will wait until this number gets out as far as it can go maybe i get a 240 and if i get a 240 all the better but i am going to go ahead and fade the steam here i don't love doing it so it's only gonna be a half unit play for me based off of whenever i see that steam moving i don't stop playing it but i am going to back off of how much i bet because i don't like disagreeing with the market that much that's just who i am as a better we got one more on the board let's talk about the minnesota Timberwolves taking on the Los Angeles Clippers. We're head to head on this one as well, Michael. Tell me why you're on the Clips minus six and a half. So the Minnesota Timberwolves have been a match of nightmare for the Clippers 
for this this season, really yep. just like the double big has given the Clippers fits. Obviously, that's not going to be present without Carl Anthony Towns. I do think we're going to have Rudy Gobert back. Is that correct? He's been upgraded to questionable. I'll talk about kind of the implications of the number in a second. But my my thought is that there is a very strong possibility that he plays. Yeah, I was moving with this priced in. I do think if you're going to try and beat Gobert on a pick and roll, you have potentially the best pick and roll player ever in James Harden doing it on the other side. Uh, I don't know if that's an inflammatory comment on buckets, um, but I just think Kawhi and Paul George, they're both going to be active. They both missed last game because of the brutal schedule spot going off of a back-to-back to that afternoon LA game. There was 19 hours between games in a back-to-back We have seen it in the NBA. We saw, I think, tonight with the Celtics or even with the Nuggets. Teams are not thrown in the towel since the Nets did that rest everybody thing except for play Bridges one quarter, and they got fined like $500,000. The teams aren't giving the middle finger to the league, and they're not doing this rest everybody in tough situations. That was the lone exception where it's like, okay, we actually understand because the 19-hour turnaround in the back-to-back to an afternoon game is brutal and you have two injury prone players fully expect Kawhi to be upgraded Paul George to be active and Harden to be a full go on the other side I just without Towns this offense has been so stuck in the mud and I trust the Clippers offense to be able to initiate because what the Minnesota Timberwolves do well to stop is something that James Harden is so efficient at breaking okay so let's talk we've got to kind of work through this all right so first off here's what I'll say um I've got this power rated with the Clippers on a three and four and Timberwolves with a one day rest, normal, normal rest for them. I've got this Clippers minus one. So what's that's for full season. And I haven't been done the downgrade on towns yet. I can't downgrade them five him. Like Carl Anthony towns is not worth five and a half points. The Minnesota Timberwolves. He's been great this season. He's having a really great season. Like people don't realize like, go Amazing. look at, go look at what he's done. Like he's been awesome. And he really has fought defensively. But he's not worth five and a half. Like that's an Embiid number. Okay. Like two, three, somewhere in there. Fine. No problem. I think it's probably a little heavy. I'd probably put two and a half ballpark. I'd have to check some of the numbers, but I'd probably put two and a half. Just can't get there. Okay. So maybe this is built, built off of Towns and Gobert. Okay. Um, Gobert's been upgraded to questionable. I have a hard time. Kawhi is still questionable. PG is still questionable. I think they'll play. I think they took the game off the other day, and I think they're going to play in this one. It's an important one for them to try and catch up ground. I think they're targeting it smartly. They are at home. That matters. But the Clippers have also been – they've gone 8-7 and seven straight up in the last 15 games. Like, they just aren't playing as well. I don't – I'm not overreacting as much because two things. One, I care much more about how you play in December and January. That's how I – if I'm grading you, like that stuff matters a lot more. I can downgrade you based off of how you're playing right now in a short term, but my full power rating on you is going to be much higher. Two, um, sometimes teams just like have stretches. Like good teams have stretches where they struggle. That's happened with everybody. I was going to say except Boston, but they just lost back-to-back games. That's like a terrible week for the Boston Celtics is to lose twice in a week. Um, so basically what I'm saying is it's okay. that the, like I'm not saying the Clippers are frauds. I'm just saying like, this is them better. If the Wolves are going to have to catch them without Towns, this is probably the time that you want to do it. Lastly, you kind of mentioned about this stuff. One of the keys here is Harden used to be able to get Rudy on switches and then attack him downhill because Rudy would play drop. That happens so often that versus Houston, they started like Rudy learned how to play up and contain a little bit more in space. And the Wolves in particular this season have the ability to put two on ball and blitz. That's risky. Because then you have a four on a four on three, and that's tough to do when you have the ball handlers that they have. But the other problem is like Ty Lue loves small ball lineups. Like he's gonna roll out that five guard nonsense in this game. Yeah. And I think it's gonna get killed if Rudy's back. Uh Jay, I'm really curious as to your take on this game. I'm really curious as to your take on this game. I think it's a fascinating game. I can't get there on the number. I'm sure the Clippers win this game, but this is more than two possessions. It's well over that key number. Michael mentioned a five. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and grab the points with the six and a half of the Minnesota Timberwolves who have proven to be a tough team, no matter who is in or out of the lineup. What do you think, Jay? 
Well, I agree with you on the number. It is a little bit uh, larger than I'd like to lay with the Clippers, especially like how they're playing right now. But this Wolves offense, man, um, it's really like the, when when the when the Quick Wolves fan. play really well, they they really play good defense. Their defense is top tier. The offense, man, it's just Anthony Edwards just dribbling the ball around. Uh, looking for foul calls, and when he's not getting them, it's really tough. Like, if Michael Conley isn't hitting threes, like, they really miss Carnton Towns over there. And I, I watched their last couple games really closely, like, a couple of times, the Lakers and the uh, Cavs. Now, obviously, those are really great defensive teams as well, but they're going up against another great defensive team here in the Clippers. Then you got, got Anthony Edwards talking about that Paul George and Kawhi Leonard are old. You're giving them added motivation. Like, that's the type of – I look for things like that, added, things that aren't really shown on the court. Um, They're they're gunning for the Timberwolves. Is it, this is their chance to tie up the season series as well. Uh two two. They just beat them in Minnesota recently as well with Car Anthony Towns uh playing getting 18 points as well. So uh without Cat in this one, I know Gobert might be back. They might get Monte Morris. Everybody that's questionable in this game should play. And I, I still think that the Clippers might end up getting the job done. But it, it is a few too many points for me to lay. But um the Wolves, their offense, man, I just I can't trust it right now. I can't. I can't so do here's it. what's what's really fascinating about this is okay. Minnesota is one of those teams that's top five in free throw rate on the season and yet since january 30th uh the over is 10 and 7 so like what's going on here this is a good example of the market is is appropriately rating minnesota's offense it's not that they are they're not like wildly off they're not like artificially dropping it they're just like really on point here. Like 10 and seven is profitable since the all-star break. It's worse, but it's still like their last, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. They're five and two to the over in their last seven games. And it's not on the defensive end because they're still holding teams down pretty low or close to the, their expected marks. The problem is like the wolves are not necessarily going under every single game. They're just like slightly over. So um, I think it's going to be a really great matchup. I think it's going to be a fascinating coaching matchup. That's what I really want to see about this one is what the coaching matchup looks like. Um, but I think it will be interesting. The clip, the best way to attack this Wolves team is what I kind of talked about with the Pacers. And the Mavericks will do this if they face the Wolves in a matchup. It's what the, the Mavericks did in 2022 is you don't put Gobert in pick and roll. You take his guy and you park their ass in the corner. And you make Gobert have to cover all the way inside from the, from the corner to help at the rim and then have to recover to the outside. The problem is the Clippers don't have those guys. They don't have stretch bigs. So they might go to the quiet five lineup and that might work. Like that is the answer here. The question is going to be, does Ty Lue go to that at this point in the season? At this point in the season with the guys banged up, does he go to that? That's how they they can win a series versus the Wolves, but they're gonna have, like that's gonna have to be the mechanism they go to because a lot of their alternatives I think are really gonna struggle. I think it's a, it's a fascinating game. We'll see how it turns out. To review tonight on the show, uh, Jay is on the Knicks minus anything up to minus seven, right, Jay? Yep. Yep. Uh, I've got OKC under two thirty eight and a half. Mike Michael has over OKC Indiana two thirty six, but. Not not as strong at 237 and a half. Uh, see if that number comes back down. He's on the Clippers, minus six and a half. I've got the Wolves, plus six and a half. And I've got the Knicks under 211 and a half. That was mostly a model and a uh, spot play with that game versus the Sixers. I'm also probably going to play the Knicks here too. Their, their cap was really good on that game. All right, it's going to do it for buckets. My thanks to Tito. Our producer doing live buckets tonight. My thanks to David Payne, our audio producer, getting this up on YouTube uh, or on the podcast form. My thanks to the video team for cutting this stuff up on youtube.com slash the action network. Tomorrow night, Sean Little, Jay Money, Albert Wynn, the analytics capper will have you best bets for Wednesday. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate you guys being with us. So we'll see you again. Let's get buckets.